Without knowing much about it, I bought this jukebox amp off of eBay. It looked pretty crusty, but it also, from what I could tell, was relatively powerful. So I get it. It is crusty, but I've had crusty old console pulls, and they weren't any big deal. So I figured no sweat. I pulled the tubes and started cleaning it up, scrubbing it a bit. I had to be careful with scrubbing it because it has silkscreen lettering. Thought maybe I can still save the finish and the silkscreen lettering, but maybe not. I inspected the wiring and so on in the bottom some more and found that a lot of the sheathing on the wires was disintegrating. There were some wires spliced with duct tape. Yikes. Given the crusty wiring of the transformers, I decided to remove the bells from both of the output transformers. One of them was in pretty good shape. Not a lot of corrosion or rust on the inside, but the other was in pretty bad shape. Lots of rust on the inside of the bells and lots of crustiness of the wires. I had to remove the crusty wires down to the taps and splice on new wires and then patch everything back up with masking tape and scotch tape. I was able to remove a lot of the rust from the rusty bells and repaint the bells. Of course, I repainted the bells for both transformers, and those came out pretty nicely. The power transformer was in similar shape to the bad output transformer. It needed to have the bells removed and all the wires redone, as I had with the bad output transformer. And you can see here the detritus. With the transformers removed and most of the wiring underneath removed, I scrubbed and scoured the chassis again, hoping I could maybe save the finish, but it was kind of a lost cause. I painted the transformers with black high gloss paint, and those came out pretty nicely. Since I couldn't save the finish, I decided to repaint the chassis with copper paint, so I carefully applied masking tape to all the tube sockets, etc. Spray painted the chassis a nice copper. Also covered many of the holes with steel plates that I screwed into place and painted those along with the rest of the chassis. The look is pretty nice. I'm just starting a test build of this jukebox amplifier, the uh, AMI Row R2620. And just starting with power coming in through the fuse, etc. I've got the power connected to the transformer primary. You can see the brown wire. I'll replace that with something better, but for now. I've got one in one part of the brown wires going to one terminal of the fuse. Now to the other terminal we've got a red and black, which goes to one of the posts on the switch. The other of the brown wires goes to the to the other post across from it on the switch, and then the common posts in the middle are connected to the leads from the transformer, which I've twisted a bit. And from the transformer, we got the yellow wires. That's the five volt winding for the rectifier tube. So I've got the secondary red wires from the transformer go into the rectifier tube and also the 5 volt winding and then off of one of the posts this one for the 5 for the on the <laughs> for this post on the rectifier and we've got wire coming down to the first capacitor now in this amplifier, the B-plus comes straight off of that for, so that, I haven't hooked up the other ends of those wires yet, but those wires will go directly to, directly to the screens of the output tubes, and this will go to the red wires also. on the output transformers. So I've also now got one resistor attached to the first capacitor, I'll take that put a lead on there up to one of those terminals. More wiring. Simplest first. These are the windings for the heaters for the tubes. So brown to the driver tubes 
terminals here. And the green going up to the other one. Those are the 6.3 volts AC supplies. And then we've got this red and green wire, which is going to be for the negative supply for the bias voltage supply. The output tubes are grid biased or fixed bias. So we go here to the back end of a diode and then drop 100 ohms and put in a capacitor. But note that it's the negative terminal of the capacitor that's connected here and the positive to ground. And then drop another resistor, this one a 10k and from there send a 15k to ground and then pull off the bias voltage supplies and I'll put those to terminals somewhere along here or here respectively and those will go to 250k resistors to the cathodes of the output tubes. After getting the negative bias voltage, finished wiring the supplies for the driver tubes. So we've got power coming from the rectifier tube down to the first capacitor. And as I said before, that's where the B plus is drawn off. And we've got one dropping resistor terminated up there to the next capacitor and that's buried, the post is buried under there. And then another dropping resistor, the one in the back there to the next post there in the middle. And then two more dropping resistors up to that last capacitor. That's where the driver tube supply comes off. Power supply is wired up, although the power supplies to the tubes are not wired up except for, as you can see, the, uh, the heater supplies. So I don't know, but I might need to at least buck the heater voltages. I'm getting 6.6 .6 volts AC on the output and driver tube heaters and 5.1 volts on the rectifier heater. This is a cool shot where you, these particular tubes uh, are transparent on the bottom and so you can see the glow of the heaters from the bottom, at least for the output tubes. Those are the output tubes that you can see. The uh, you can't, Oh yeah, you can kind of glimpse through that narrow opening, the heater glow for the driver, for that driver tube, and, and that one. And then we've got from the top side. So far, no smoke. This is not dim bulb, this is plugged into the mains. So far, so good. Well, I've been busy wiring stuff up course. So wired up the output transformers. One channel and other. And been wiring up also of course the output tubes. As you can see I had to, this is how I'm building this all from salvaged parts, I had to get rather creative with making the coupling capacitors for the output stage between the driver and output stages. And I've got one salvaged single one, but the rest still have one that I still need to make or find or whatever. I usually like to proceed from left to right in the schematic, that is from input to output. So let's see here, you can see the uh, input coupling capacitor there going from the input of one channel to the input of one of the pair of triodes and so on through wiring up those those triodes. But I'm gonna need to utilize connector thingies here, and I wanted to make sure that I didn't use them to the detriment of, of what I would need for the output tubes. So I went ahead and decided to wire up the output tubes. So it's gotten a little bit uh, chaotic. 
And as you can see, there's just leads poking up all over the place, but trying to keep at least the power wiring relatively neat and tidy. The rest I can change later. Got almost all the wiring done here. I've got both capacitor networks on the output stages. I've got the secondaries wired up with the feedback network. The only thing left is to go from the secondary of the output transformer to the output terminals at the very top and the bottom of the frame near the output transformers. And now for some testing results. First we see the maximum power at 1 kilohertz. 13.3 volts RMS corresponds to 22.1 watts. That's at 1 kilohertz. Changing the frequency down to 40 hertz, we get 12.6 rather distorted volts. That 12.6 volts corresponds to 19.8 watts. They're at 40 hertz. Now, if we turn the frequency all the way down to 20 hertz without doing anything else, we get 8.1 volts, which corresponds to 8.2 watts of very ugly sound at 20 hertz. Now, if we look for what's my maximum undistorted wattage at 40 hertz, we see here we've got 4.36 volts, which corresponds to 2.38 watts at 40 hertz. And then we start turning up the frequency. Here we go to 400 hertz. We've got 4.71 volts RMS, which corresponds to 2.72 watts. Go on up to 1 kilohertz, where it stays pretty flat. That 4.73 volts corresponds to 2.80 watts. We crank it up to 10 kilohertz. We've got 5.02 volts, which corresponds to 3.15 watts. Looking a little bright there. That is, the power has gone up at the higher frequency. And we can see at 20 kilohertz, it goes up even more to 5.76 volts or 4.15 watts. And it keeps going up above that. We can see at 21 kilohertz, it's all the way up to 5.83 volts or 4.25 watts. Now, those are high enough frequencies that we're not going to notice that being overly bright. The important bit here is that we've got relatively flat response, especially between 400 hertz and 1 kilohertz. It rolls off a little below that. And so far, we have a very pretty amplifier. Here we are, all wired up and ready to go. First, I plugged it into the preamp output of a Pioneer SX990. I don't know if you noticed, but the sound out of the preamp of the Pioneer SX990 wasn't so great. There seemed to be a hole in the upper mids. That is, some of the vocals just kind of went into a hole. And it appears to be the fault of the Pioneer SX990 preamp, not the amplifier itself. Because next, you'll see when I plug it into the output of this Fisher preamp, this Fisher CC3000 preamp, we get something quite different.
Light of hand and twist of feet on a bed of 